Let's talk about some things, shall we? No! No way. Definitely no. Not a chance. A long, long time ago, in February 2020, Ireland had a general election. Since the 1930s, the two dominant parties have been Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. In this past general election, there was a surge in popularity for a third party, Sinn Féin. The two-horse race had now become a three-horse race. A lot of this was down to Sinn Féin's popularity amongst younger voters and the belief that their policies on housing and healthcare, for example, were better than those of the traditional parties. The previous Fine Gael government oversaw liberalised constitutional changes like the introduction of same-sex marriage and the removal of Ireland's constitutional ban on abortion. But while these things happened under a Fine Gael government, they were the results of decades-long grassroots campaigns. Ireland has the youngest population in Europe, a large number of whom became politically motivated around those referenda. They were also impacted by the collapse of the Irish economy under Fianna Fáil and the following years of austerity measures under Fianna Gael. The 2016 general election that followed the marriage equality referendum saw smaller parties and independents rise in popularity. In 2020, the benefactor was Sinn Féin, a result which effectively saw a three-way tie between Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael and Sinn Féin. This was, in part, thanks to the Vote Left Transfer Left movement. Vote Left Transfer Left was born from left-leaning social media. Ireland uses a single transferable vote electoral system where voters rank their political candidates in order of preference. The vote left transfer left hashtag encouraged voters to transfer their votes to left-leaning parties, essentially meaning don't vote for the government parties. However, Sinn Féin did not run enough candidates to form a government, so after a few months and a slight pandemic, we got a Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, Mr. Eamon Ryan, and the Greens coalition. Whatever about the Greens, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael being in government together is historic, because those two parties were born out of the split that resulted in the Irish Civil War. The current state of play in the Dáil, the Irish Parliament, is that we have a centre-right government and a centre-left opposition in Sinn Féin. The reoccurring theme from both Fine Gael leader Leo Varadkar and Fianna Fáil's Micheál Martin has been that Sinn Féin are not a normal party, that they are unfit for government, that because of their actions in the power-sharing government in Northern Ireland, they are hypocritical, that they are Trumpian, woke, populist, and that they are bullies. There is significant incompatibility in terms of the policy, the policy questions. Of ourselves. We have real concerns about and just democracy within their party. Market. Fine Gael, for example, seem to have a weekly release schedule of uh, Sinn Féin attack videos. Sinn Féin routinely does one thing in the north while promising to do the opposite in the south. Sinn Féin has long maintained... Resting in your account. These words sum up three words. The corruption of Sinn Féin and the lies and that it is a 32-county organisation. Their politicians have claimed that Sinn Féin are both against the white middle-class man and that they are causing divisions in Irish politics. And have you heard about the troubles in the IRA? Because uh, Fine Gael have, and they want you to know about it. Yeah, that's very true. I'm looking forward to where this is going. For many voters, particularly the young, the exclusion of Sinn Féin is more about the establishment protecting itself than morality. It is true that many of these voters cannot recall the troubles, either indeed can some of Sinn Féin's newly elected TDs, the party's president, Mary Lou Macdonald herself, did not join the organisation until after the IRA's final ceasefire. But rather than not caring about the violence inflicted by the IRA, as some charge, many note that Sinn Féin's critics seem solely concerned with Republican activities, with no equivalent focus on the violence carried out by British or Loyalist forces, since both Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael have roots in the revolution of 1919-21 and declare pride in the old IRA, their critiques of Sinn Féin's past seem hypocritical. I would like you to keep this current context in mind for some things that will come up later. For now, keep in mind that at present, Ireland has an establishment government party and a rising political opposition which has never been in government, but has some links to paramilitary activity from the nation's recent past. And that the threat of new opposition has the establishment so scared that they feel the only way forward is to attack. The current state of play of Irish politics really puts me in mind of another time. A time when there was also a housing crisis, an economic depression, a single party that had been in government for much of the previous decade, a slight question over the future of the Northern Irish border, and the mild problem of uh, a little bit of right-wing extremism. 
At an attractive little summer hotel in a remote section of Western Ireland, we had the pleasure of an interview with the Honorable William T. Cosgrove. The single party was coming to Gale. The party was founded by members of Sinn Féin who were in favour of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Coming to Gale ran a government led by W.T. Cosgrave from 1923 till 1932. They took on a newly formed Irish Free State following the Civil War. The state was bankrupt and there was a need to re-establish order following a long period of conflict on the island. And it was during this period that much of the structures of the Irish state were built. In their decade in government, Cumann and Gael were quite successful at promoting the Irish Free State on the world stage. The Free State joined the League of Nations in 1923. Unlike other Commonwealth nations, Ireland got its own representative in the US. On the issue of Northern Ireland, as part of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, a border commission was meant to decide the precise nature of the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Free State. Cumann and Gael were a pro-treaty party. The Anglo-Irish Treaty had been seen as a stepping stone to a fully independent united Ireland. The Border Commission was a big chance of gaining a little ground. However, it didn't quite work out that way. The report of the Commission was leaked to the press in November 1925. The leaked document recommended only tiny changes to the border. After the leak, the Commission report was suppressed by Cosgrave, UK Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, and Northern Irish Prime Minister James Craig. In the end, all the Irish Free State got was the cancellation of its liability for British national debt, which while in and of itself was not a bad thing, the failure to make up any ground on the question of Irish unity was a black mark against the Common Nigel government and was swiftly followed by the foundation of Eamon de Valera's Fianna Fáil party. Domestically, Cosgrave's government was mainly economically conservative. They preferred free trade, kept taxes low, and mostly wanted to just keep the balance sheet looking nice. In 1924, there were cuts to the old age pension, as well as pay cuts for teachers and public servants. The government focused much of its economic policy around agriculture rather than industry. The Irish Free State had been the most rural area of the UK prior to independence. Partition of the island meant that the most industrialized part of Ireland remained in the UK. Although in a deviation from their conservative spending, they did invest in the Shannon Hydroelectric Scheme, which went over budget. Whatever successes their focus on agriculture brought was undone by the Great Depression. The effects of the Great Depression saw high unemployment, a housing shortage, and the usual Irish escape valve of emigration to the United States no longer being an attractive option. The problems facing Cumann Gale can be summed up by the following. Falling government revenue, increasing demands for services, falling prices and increased unemployment and the absence of emigrants' remittances. Over the course of the 1920s, the party had grown steadily more conservative. The pro-treaty Republican element, which had existed within the party, while it never went away, lost some impetus in no small thanks to some of its members' involvement in the army mutiny of 1924. The result pushed Cumann and Gale more towards the base of middle-class professionals and big farmers. Their opponents began to tar the party as West Brits. They were a party that had been born into national government and seemed detached from the electorate. Eamon de Valera along with 12,000 anti-treatyites, had been imprisoned during the Civil War, only being released in 1924. Initially, Sinn Féin had refused to recognise the Irish Free State or enter the Dáil, as entering the Dáil would require taking an oath of allegiance to the British Crown. Instead, they operated their own Republican government with de Valera as its head. This underground government also included members of the IRA who were still intent on overthrowing the Free State government. The IRA had not renounced violence. In 1931 alone, they carried out six assassinations. It was estimated that they had just under 5,000 members in 1931, with not inconsiderable dumps of weapons, including 850 rifles, and 29 machine guns, as well as many handguns and some explosives. However, de Valera, rather than sit on the sidelines, in 1926 split from Sinn Féin with a number of his followers and created a new party, Fianna Fáil, the Soldiers of Destiny. 
because the only way to get Dev out of Irish politics was for him to go blind and die. Fianna Fáil styled themselves as the Republican Party and pitched themselves as representatives of small farmers and the working class. Their policies included a more protectionist economic stance. They wanted to ban land annuities, which were payments on British government loans to Irish tenant farmers, as part of the Irish Land Acts. These were not cancelled along with the other debts owed by the Free State to Britain under the 1925 agreement. In government, de Valera would enact his protectionist policies and enter into a trade war with Britain. He claims his health is fine, but after dragging a donkey around all day, he becomes a bit fatigued. On July 10, 1927, Minister for Justice Kevin O'Higgins was assassinated, resulting in the passing of a bill that required all political candidates to swear that they would take the oath if elected, thus forcing de Valera's party to enter the doll or lose their seats. And so, they entered the doll with de Valera declaring the oath an empty formula. Fianna Fáil became the largest and most credible threat to Cumann Gael, who held on as a minority government in two elections in 1927. The election in 1932 would prove more decisive, as Fianna Fáil were well placed to challenge the government party. I think I, think I know where this is going. During the 1932 election, Cumann Gael chose to focus on their record of 10 years in government and how they had brought law and order to the Free State. They also ran a negative campaign against Fianna Fáil, who ran on their protectionist economic policies, industrial development, self-sufficiency, and improvements for housing and social security, as well as freeing IRA prisoners and abolishing the Oath of Allegiance. Cumann Gael's posters attempted to smear Fianna Fáil as communists who were run by the IRA. They presented Fianna Fáil as a party with no experience in government who would surely fail. They literally compared Fianna Fáil to a circus act in one poster. The Irish Times on the day of the election ran an advert that said, The gunmen and communists are voting for Fianna Fáil today. Vote for the government party. The results, Fianna Fáil got 72 seats and Cumann na Gael 57. The scaremongering didn't work. Cumann na Gael were out of government. Fianna Fáil were in. The handover of power was peaceful though there had been fears it would not be. The government party was no longer in government, which they were not prepared for at all. But were Cumann and Gael correct? Were the IRA involved with Fianna Fáil? Yes, they were. The IRA were pretty important to Fianna Fáil's campaign. In order to build up their grassroots, Fianna Fáil used their connections amongst the nationalists and they were supported by members of the IRA, which, following the Public Safety Act of 1931, was a banned organization. The IRA provided campaigners and the cause of an emotive campaign to release IRA prisoners. When Fianna Fáil got into government, the IRA was unbanned and prisoners freed. At one point, de Valera wanted them to become an army reserve. But were they communists? No. There was a dominant group within the IRA who were socially radical. But de Valera didn't think that communism was suitable for the Irish people. I doubt there is any country in the world that presents such an unfruitful field for communism as our country. The individualistic tendencies of our people are against it. The system of land tenure, peasant proprietorship, is against it. And for their part, the Irish people never showed a large interest in communism. And Fianna Fáil winning the general election was seen by some as a victory for the IRA. The effects of the Great Depression coincided with the IRA growing in numbers. This, alongside de Valera entering into an economic war with Britain, helped foster a certain anti-IRA force. But before getting into that, I'd like to look at some events in Europe and how they had their own impact on Ireland, and also explain why Cumann Gael went down that Red Scare route in 1932 to begin with. In 1931, Alfonso XIII of Spain was deposed. This led to the founding of the Second Spanish Republic, under whose constitution the Catholic Church was disestablished and religious orders prohibited from participating in education. In Ireland, this was seized upon by the Church. Priests condemned the short-lived left-wing party Ser Era, formed around the same time, from the pulpit. The group, founded by left-wing members of the IRA, was described as frankly communistic, 
and it was claimed that they were trying to impose upon the Catholic soil of Ireland the same material regime with its fanatical hatred of God as now dominates Russia and threatens to dominate Spain. Comenigueo used Spain as a reason to attack Fianna Fáil, help the government party to eliminate once and for all the danger of a Spanish Republic in Ireland. A careless electorate gave Spain a weak government. Then the rest came. While Fianna Fáil member Aide de Blachon wrote of awful scenes of revolutionary violence, the chief fury of the Red Host was wrecked upon the church. The church was seized upon as the enemy. Bishops and priests who failed to escape into hiding were slaughtered. The case of Spain was scary to the Irish people. The Irish Free State was a country where war was a recent memory, as was a struggle for freedom from a foreign power, and communism was seen as an invasive foreign force. Anti-communism went alongside morality campaigns that sought to ban alcohol, cocktails, immodest fashion, cinema and jazz, all of which were led by the Catholic Church. The Free State was a poor country. Dublin, for example, had quite large numbers of people living in terrible conditions, with over 25,000 people living in tenements in the city. Agriculture employed 50% of the population. However, the dominant form of agriculture was livestock farming, which required less workers, not to mention the worldwide economic depression. Yet, there was never an overwhelming turn to communism. Nationalism dominated Irish politics throughout this period. Post-independence Irish politics was drawn along the lines of the national question and not class struggle. Ireland's Catholicism was a barrier to communism. The church was influential and important. Irish people were, in the main, devout Catholics. Which led, for a time anyway, to a bit of admiration in Irish political and clerical circles for the Italian fascist leader Benito Mussolini. He was doing the opposite of what those terrible Spanish communists were doing. Mussolini had made religious education compulsory, gave priority to Catholic schools, and was dead against immodest fashion. Mussolini's ideas around authority of family, religion, and the importance of morality matched with common opinions held by Irish bishops and politicians like Cosgrave and de Valera. By the way, uh, I think in justice to Signor Mussolini, I ought to tell you that he has a well, very wonderful head. De Valera himself could have, if he wanted, have played the role of an Irish Mussolini, because, as Joseph Lee writes, the more strident versions of integral nationalism, favoured on some Fianna Fáil platforms, could veer close to the fascist variant. Aspects of Fianna Fáil's autarkic economic policy were reminiscent of fascist panaceas. Some Fianna Fáil spokesmen clung to the ideas of Agarian utopia as insistently as any fascist rhetorician, and Fianna Fáil certainly possessed the type of charismatic leader cherished by fascist ideologists. Fianna Fáil were able to corner the market of the underdog. They had the charismatic leader and used pageantry and their roots in Irish history, but at the same time, they were also allied with Labour rather than making the Labour Party their enemy. The party managed to be sympathetic to both trade unionism and state capitalism. Had the 1932 general election gone the other way, it could have been possible that some of the Fianna Fáil support could have been tempted towards fascism. However, it was not from de Valera's party that Ireland's most well-remembered and at least outwardly performative fascist style group was born. There's more on this at finnegoyle.ie. Following Cumann Gael's defeat in the 1932 general election, Fianna Fáil suspended the Public Safety Act, under which the IRA had been banned. They also released IRA prisoners. The IRA attempted to break up Cumann Gael meetings through acts of intimidation and violence. The response from former Commandant of the Free State Army, Ned Cronin, was to create the Army Comrades Association, an organisation composed of Army veterans. The group took to wearing a blue shirt, essentially so they could recognise one another in riots. The colour was the suggestion of Ernest Blythe. Blythe had been the Minister for Finance in Cumann na Gael's government. Blythe would later be involved in the fascist party al na Hashagi. It also contained sitting TDs Patrick McGilligan and Desmond Fitzgerald. These men were all leading Common Gael politicians. However, it was insisted that the ACA was non-political. They were, first and foremost, an anti-IRA organisation. 
they also believed that the IRA was implicitly a communist organization. In choosing the color blue, they chose to identify themselves with St. Patrick, connecting the movement to Irish historical mythology and placing themselves in opposition to the IRA, who were associated with green. The ACA thought themselves the rightful successors to the Irish volunteers, again linking themselves to an element of Ireland's past. Other than trying to place itself within national history and mythology, what else does a prospective fascist organization need? A charismatic leader. O'Duffy was the commissioner of Angarda until 1933. He resigned, rather than make way for de Valera's preferred choice of commissioner. There was also the minor issue that he had been one of the people urging Cosgrave to stage a coup against the Fianna Fáil government. O'Duffy had a long history within Irish revolutionary movements. First, he joined the Irish Volunteers through the GAA, where he had been a successful organiser and had rebuilt the GAA in his native county Monaghan. By 1918, he was a driving force in the IRA in Ulster. In 1921, he became Director of Operations at IRA GHQ. His skills as an organiser landed him a role in maintaining discipline in what became on Garda Giacana, and he was charged with instilling an ethos which fit the new state. His sacking was seen as an attack on the upstanding members of society. Following his dismissal from his role as Garda Commissioner, he was invited to join the Army Comrades Association and became its new leader in July 1933. The group changed its name to the National Guard in homage to Mussolini's group of the same name. O'Duffy, Blythe and other prominent members shared an admiration for Mussolini. They adopted the greeting of Hoch O'Duffy, an obvious take on Heil Hitler. They also, prior to O'Duffy's arrival, had adopted a one-armed Roman salute. At their height, they had about 30,000 members. Branches of the Blue Shirts held weekly parades after Sunday Mass. Members also went on social and sporting events, cycling, picnics, dances, hurling, boxing, or playing Gaelic football. Because of his background, O'Duffy was looked upon as a natural successor to Michael Collins. A Blue Shirt publication wrote, Michael is gone to his eternal reward, but he has left with us a worthy successor in the general. And while the general lives, we have no doubt that his chief idol will be Michael Collins. His nationality is as sound as Michael's was. His love of Ireland is great. The youth of Ireland have him as a leader who will emulate the great deeds of Ireland's greatest hero and patriot. This was something O'Duffy played up himself. He had the credentials and had been friends with Collins. Collins' sister gave his revolver to O'Duffy after her brother's death. Collins was a patron saint to the Blue Shirt movement, and it would be commemorating Collins, among others, that would lead to the Blue Shirts being banned. Paddle your own canoe, sung by Collins and Harlan. De Valera viewed the Blue Shirts as a threat just as Cosgrave had the IRA. The Cumberna Gale slash Blue Shirt members Blythe, McGilligan and Fitzgerald had their firearm licenses revoked on the weekend of the 30th of July 1933, which was followed by moves to disarm the National Guard. While attempts were made to portray it as a non-violent organisation, it did engage in acts of violence against the IRA, communists and government officials collecting land annuities, which Fianna Fáil continued to collect, although they had stopped paying them to Britain. The Blue Shirts also resisted Fianna Fáil's policy of seizing unsold cattle to be distributed as meat for the poor. In August 1933, O'Duffy's group planned a parade to commemorate Arthur Griffith, Michael Collins and Kevin O'Higgins. Perceiving this as a Mussolini-like march on Rome, and fearing that the army might support the ex-servicemen blue shirts, on August 22nd, the government banned the parade. When the National Guard instead held smaller local events, the government saw this as defying the ban. Under Article 2A of the Constitution, the same article which had been inserted by Cumberna Gale in response to the growing IRA threat, the National Guard was banned. With the blue shirts now outlawed, 
they turned towards party politics and linked up with the centre-right parties, the former government party in Cumann na Gael and the national centre party. Cumann na Gael had ended up believing their own hype. They believed that Fianna Fáil would not succeed in government. They also believed the electorate would see through them. This did not happen. O'Duffy's ability to mobilise pro-treaty support was something Cumann na Gael needed. The National Guard, Cumann na Gael and the Centre Party merged in September 1933 to create Fine Gael. A party born because the opposition, independently, seemed incapable of challenging Fianna Fáil. The banned National Guard reformed as Young Ireland and then the League of Youth. O'Duffy was made the first president of Fine Gael and attended rallies all around the country, speaking in 23 of the 26 counties by March 1934 to his supporters, all offering Roman salutes in return. Fine Gael TDs wore the blue shirt in the doll chamber. Their first major test came in the 1934 local elections. Participating in local elections was a deviation from how Cumann na Gael had operated. The party had never shown much interest in local politics. O'Duffy predicted that Fine Gael would win control of 20 out of 23 local councils. They won six. O'Duffy did not handle this well. He got more extremist in his speeches and was described as generally destructive and hysterical. He certainly held extreme views. For one, he was not a fan of parliamentary politics. Party politics, he once said, has served its purpose and the sooner a change is effected, the better. While O'Duffy often read speeches prepared for him, he was known to fly off the handle. He was once told, when you stick to your notes, General, you're the greatest speaker there is. But let some old woman shout up Dev, and God knows what you'll say next. Here are some examples of O'Duffy's statements. As sure as we are here, we shall be masters of Ireland in three years. We do not want party politics and politicians. We want a disciplined and well-governed country. This evolution is inevitable. When we think of the striking similarity of the Italy to which Mussolini came as leader and our own present day Ireland, we realize that this book, Mussolini's The Political and Social Doctrine of Fascism, will have more than a passing value to those who are interested in rescuing our country from weak government this is not to say that Ireland can be rescued only by fascism, but we would be fools were we to shut our eyes to the fact that behind fasci in Italy and responsible for its phenomenal success is the same spirit that is now making the blue shirt movement the biggest political movement that Ireland has ever known. As president of Fine Gael, he was himself aiming for complete power and a fascist style state. He eventually resigned on September 21st, 1934. After this, O'Duffy got more extreme. He formed the openly fascist National Corporate Party. Fine Gael, as a party, did its best to ignore, muffle and marginalise the fascist elements of the Blue Shirts. But were the Blue Shirts fascists? It depends who you ask. They thought Ireland needed radical, social, political and economic restructuring, but in the main were not anti-democracy. They weren't anti-communist for any other reason than a religious one, and most saw themselves as moderates. They were a group formed of ex-servicemen, people who could, with the right encouragement, have been moulded into a fascist political force. That said, for some, fascism was far too intellectually demanding. What passed for their ideology was traditionally conservative with a little corporatism and not generally anti-democratic. Most of their members had no ambition to create a dictatorship, save for the likes of O'Duffy and Ned Cronin, who once said, if a dictatorship is necessary for the Irish people, we are going to have one. The nature of blue shirtism remains a subject of controversy. While its growth in 1933 was linked to the economic war, O'Duffy and other leading members were admirers of continental fascism. Most blue shirts appear to have been motivated by a mixture of civil war legacies and the controversies of the early 1930s. They very much had the potential to have been more fascist than they were ever allowed to be. What the blue shirts offered 
was a populist answer to Fianna Fáil. Traditional conservatives within Fianna Gael recoiled from O'Duffy's fascism. There were people in the middle, like Blythe and Fitzgerald, who saw a need for a blue shirt movement, but they were not committed to total fascism. In the face of a strong de Valera government, the extremist movement had little chance of success. The traditional right used the blue shirt movement to gain popularity and then were successful in being able to marginalize it. The blue shirts might have been the most influential anti-communist group, but they were not the only one in the free state. Around 1933, St. Patrick's Anti-Communist League was founded. Their general secretary, PJ Duffy, claimed in 1934 that there were over 600 communists in Dublin alone and that they were out to destroy the Catholic Church. Over three nights in 1933, the League attacked Connolly House, the headquarters of Ireland's communist movement, in what was said to be some of the worst violence in Dublin since the Civil War. According to Bob Doyle, who took part in the rioting, but would later become a committed socialist, I had attended the evening mission on Monday 27th of March 1933 at the Pro Cathedral during the period of Lent where the preacher was a Jesuit. The cathedral was full. He was standing on the pulpit talking about the state of the country. I remember him saying, which scared me, here in the holy Catholic city of Dublin, these vile creatures of communism are within our midst. After the sermon, everybody began leaving, singing, to Jesus' heart all burning, and faith of our Father's holy faith. We marched down towards Great Strand Street, to the headquarters of the socialist and anti-fascist groups in Connolly House. There was no attempt by the police to stop us. In 1936 came the Irish Christian Front. They were led by Patrick Belton, a veteran of the Easter Rising. His group was pro-Franco, anti-communist and anti-Semitic. Their rallies on one occasion drew crowds of up to 40,000. They also ran a campaign to close down Dublin's thriving nudist clubs. Communists. The Irish far left was quite small. There was no widespread anti-capitalist feeling in Ireland and the capitalists that existed were small. In 1931, far left members of the IRA formed Ser Era. It was attacked by the Catholic Church and quickly banned. The Republican Congress, which followed, didn't make much of an impact either before it splintered. In 1933, the IRA had about 12,000 members, although it would not be true to say that it was a completely left-wing organization. The dominant group were socially radical, however, there was a small right-wing section as well, and a third group who were only interested in being soldiers. Early Fianna Fáil was able to take what it needed from the IRA and its left-leaning membership, but that radicalism, like its affinity with the IRA, did not last. De Valera would distance himself from the organization and eventually ban it again. Despite some groups claiming there were over 600 communists in Dublin alone in 1934, the Irish Communist Party had only re-established in 1933 had only 75 members in Dublin and scarcely any in the rest of the country. Because of the threat posed by anti-communists, the Communist Party had to rent a room under the guise of the Dublin Total Abstinence Association in order to hold their 1934 June Congress. This was a dangerous time for Ireland's radical left, who could not mobilise in significant numbers without facing the risk of physical confrontation. It's safe to say that between the communists and the IRA, they did not have the numbers when compared to the blue shirts at their peak. Let me say, Leo Varadkar has demonstrated again that he's completely out of touch with the reality of life on this island. Greetings from the editing dungeon of this video, which is the same location except the desk is the other way around. I was going to put my pre-recorded conclusion in here, but I decided based on some stuff that popped up during the editing process because I think this recent information supports the overall thesis of this video. The thesis being that there are a lot of similarities between the political situation in Ireland in the 1930s to Ireland today. In both cases there is establishment parties and a rising opposition which is untested and the establishment parties are using negative campaigning tactics 
to tar the new rising opposition. In the 1932 general election, we saw Cumming the Gale using Red Scare tactics and bringing up the IRA as a way to scaremonger people into not voting for Fianna Fáil. And Cumming the Gale's successor party, Fianna Gale, well, in 2020, they have pretty much gone down the same road from the general election right up until today when I'm recording this video. I also wanted to point out that both Fianna Fáil and the Blue Shirts had potentially fascist traits, as opposed to Fianna Fáil being the left-wing party and Cumming the Gale being the right-wing party. So Cumming the Gale's attempts to paint Fianna Fáil as a strictly left-wing communist organization was obviously not the truth. Cumming the Gale never got back into government when they formed Fianna Gale. Fianna Gale didn't get into government until 1948. So all that blue shirt stuff and the, the red scare tactics, it, it totally paid off for them in the end. And I think it's pretty clear that in the 30s, the far left did not have a chance of getting any traction in Ireland. It certainly seems that number wise, the blue shirts were a far larger organization than the IRA of the time and certainly of the Communist Party of the time. And of course, modern Fine Gael don't really want to talk about the blue shirts all that much. They're the embarrassing drunk uncle that you don't want to invite to your birthday party. Fine Gael would rather talk about Cosgrave and about Cumming the Gael and about Michael Collins than they would about the blue shirts. And for obvious reasons, it was actually Cosgrave who donned the cover of the brochure for their 75th anniversary despite the fact he wasn't in Fine Gael at the time. But the thing is, they wouldn't exist without them. Just give me a little bit more light. Bip. More light, because I'm afraid I'm going to lose light. But what actually encouraged me to record this uh, redo of my conclusion was, one, that Fine Gael's hiring policy for researchers is to ask people to research ways of attacking Sinn Féin. And also this tweet from a Fianna Fáil councillor, which um, implores people to watch The Crown on Netflix as a source for learning about Irish history. I won't get into it, but she gets things wrong in the tweet. Maybe I'll send her this video when this is done. And that tweet actually brings me to a, a very important reoccurring theme of a lot of what Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael have been doing in terms of attacking Sinn Féin. Their links to the IRA, the idea that Sinn Féin is oversaw by the Provisional IRA's Army Council, because a line in a report into paramilitary activity in Northern Ireland from 2015 says that members of the Provisional IRA believe that to be the case. Now, people believe the world is flat doesn't mean it's true. And the same report goes on to say that the PIRA of the Troubles is well beyond recall. It is our firm assessment that the PIRA's leadership remains committed to the peace process and its aim of achieving a united Ireland by political means. The group is not involved in targeting or conducting terrorist attacks against the state or its representatives. There have only been very limited indications of dissent to date and we judge that this has been addressed effectively by the leadership. Which sounds an awful lot like they're committed to the peace process. I think it's interesting that the real victim here is probably Fianna Fáil. Back in the 30s, they were the, the IRA party, the communist party, those scary far lefters. And now they're trailing behind Sinn Féin and Fianna Gael in the polls. 63% of people who gave them a first preference vote in the last general election wouldn't do it again and their current run in government with Fine Gael isn't going so stellar. I think I'll stop there and cut back to myself in the past. Over to you, me. The government parties are terrified of Sinn Féin. Not because of the IRA. Because they're threatening the two-party system. Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael don't see Sinn Féin as worthy of governing in the South. Sorry, the Republic of Ireland. They can have the North. The North doesn't matter to them unless it's politically convenient. We seem to be entering into a new phase of Irish politics. One that's going to be led by the predecessors of Cumming the Gael and the Blue Shirts and the modern version of Sinn Féin. And while the parties may be different, 
the arguments seem roughly the same. 